Hi and welcome to Physics High and today I'm going to go through the answers of the HSC paper from 2009 as they relate to module 8 which is the universe to the atom. Now just one caveat, in the old syllabus right up until the HSC of 2018, concepts that I covered in module 8 were covered in two main particular electives in the old syllabus. One had to do with astrophysics, the other one had to do with quanta to quarks, plus a smattering of a few other concepts. So it won't necessarily cover every single outcome or every single inquiry question within module eight, but hopefully this will be useful to you in helping you understand the course content. Now, before I start, I really value your support. And if you're able to click that link in the description below and buy me a coffee, I'd really appreciate it. Have help continue to support the work that I do. So let's get started. So our first question here is about Marsden and Geiger doing an experiment in which they fired alpha particles at a thin gold foil and most of the particles passed straight through. Now this is referred to as Rutherford's gold foil experiment with Marsden and Geiger doing a lot of the initial work and so they should get some credit. And it says, first of all, describe how Rutherford's model of the atom explained these results. And then to describe two problems associated with Rutherford's model and how these were explained by Bohr's model of the hydrogen atom. So first of all, why we get Rutherford's model. And reminded by the way too, that a lot of my videos cover the content here. Now the model in question at the time of Rutherford, though not Rutherford's model, was often referred to as the plum pudding model. So we have this sphere of positiveness with the embedded electrons in it, which is basically the model that J.J. Thomson developed because he discovered the electron in 1897 and proposed that an atom could be neutral if we have this positive sphere and these electrons are embedded in it, making it overall a neutral atom. But what happened here is that Rutherford's experiment, or Geiger and Marston, by firing large alpha particles, he would expect that most of them would have traveled straight through because it's basically the electrons are extremely small and so most of these would pass straight through. What did occur, however, was not that, but that the occasional ones were deflected and some were not only deflected like that, but some deflected and returned around. In essence, he likened to as firing a, a cannonball at tissue paper and having it bounce straight back. So the model he therefore surmised, and this is of course Rutherford's genius, is that the atom is no longer a sphere just filled with this positive dough with electrons embedded in it, our raisins. No, no, all of our matter, or the most of the matter is concentrated in a small nucleus, probably around a trillionth of the volume of our atom, and the electrons are in orbit around it. And so therefore our positively charged alpha particles would be repelled by the positively charged nucleus based at the center. And of course, because the nucleus, in this case gold, was significantly larger than the alpha particle, what we found of course is that the alpha particles would therefore bounce straight back. And so that's basically a description. And so in essence, what comes before and what now as a result with some detail of the experimental setup, linking the experimental setup with the actual model that he devised, gives you the two marks. Now the second part of the question is describe two problems associated with Rutherford's model and how they were explained by Bohr's model in the hydrogen atom. There are two key problems you need to highlight. The first one is, why do electrons stay in orbit but emit no energy? Now, in other words, according to Maxwell's theories, is that an accelerating electron will emit electromagnetic radiation. Because my electrons are in a circular orbit and experiencing therefore a centripetal force, therefore they are accelerating by definition and therefore should be emitting electromagnetic radiation. Now that means my electrons, therefore, if they're emitting radiations, would spiral in and you'd have this spiral death. But of course, that doesn't happen. But nor are we therefore throwing out Maxwell's equations. That was pretty much set as standard, which basically means there's a problem with Rutherford's model. The second problem 
is the fact that hydrogen gas produced certain spectral lines when light passes through them. And in no way did Rutherford's model actually explain that. So what did Bohr do? Well, Niels Bohr in 1913 proposed a new model. And that model was the fact that we have our nucleus, but then our electrons existed in very discrete shells of specific energy amount. Now, he deal, dealt this specifically in terms of hydrogen. And because of the fact that only 13 years prior, we had the idea that energy could be discrete because of E equals HF, it is possible that the electrons would stay in discrete orbits with discrete amount of energy. They are either in one orbit or another, but never in between because it's discrete. And the thing is, he was also able to tie in the fact of by actually measuring or calculating the energy differences using Planck's formula between different levels, he could explain also the absorption lines for hydrogen as a result. So those were two things that Bohr did to explain. Now, it's not a perfect model, and your subsequent studies would show that there are problems with Bohr's model along the way, but that certainly gives us a good head start. Next question. Part B, it says, describe De Broglie's proposal that a particle can exhibit both wave and particle-like properties. Second part, explain how Davidson and Germer was able to confirm De Broglie's proposal. And three, calculate the velocity of an electron that has a wavelength of 3.33 by 10 to the negative 10 meters. Now, I'm going to concentrate mainly on part one and part three. This one here is sort of touched upon in our syllabus as experimental validation of de Broglie's hypothesis. But in essence, there was a much greater focus on the experiments by Davison and Germer. But we'll discuss it as we go along. So this first describes de Broglie's proposal. Well, de Broglie's proposal was, okay, we have Bohr's model and we have discrete electron orbits. And what he would suggest is that these electrons actually were existing as waves. Now, you know that if you have a wave, you have the ability to produce a standing wave. And standing waves can only occur in discrete amounts, in discrete frequencies, so to speak. And so by suggesting that the electrons exist as waves, not particles, he was able to explain why electrons could exist in discrete orbits, they're in resonance in those particular orbits, and why we did not get electrons in between. And as a result, to establish a mathematical relationship between the wavelength of that standing wave and the momentum of our electron. And so what he had was our lambda is equal to h, there's Planck's constant again, over the momentum, which is mv. And this is crucial. De Broglie therefore established the particle wave duality, not for light, which is what Einstein did with the photoelectric effect, but now matter itself. Light has wave-like properties, but also particle-like nature. Now we have particles or atoms, not only have particle-like nature, they have wave-like nature, and it's tied to this formula over here. Explain how Davison and Germer were able to confirm De Broglie's proposal. The guts of it is that the proposal of the idea that a, something has a wave-like nature means that it can cause interference. So if I shine light through a double slit, I'm going to get interference pattern. And you know that from module seven, but the whole idea of diffraction. What Davison and Germer did was fire electrons at double slits. And instead of just getting a blob at the other side, they got interference patterns which established the fact that there was interference going on, which is a fundamentally a wave-like property. So our electrons can now produce wave-like properties, and therefore you can measure also its wavelength. Part three, calculate the velocity of an electron that has a wavelength of this amount here. Well, now we just apply this mathematical formula. We already know where the, the wavelength in terms of here, so that means comes 3.33, by 10 to the power of negative 10. We now have to substitute in our Planck's constant, which is 6 by 6, 6 to 6 by 10 to the negative 34. And we divide this by our mass and velocity. Now, of course, our velocity is what we're looking for. Our mass is 9.1 .1 by 10 to the power of negative 31. And if you rearrange that, your velocity is going to be 2.18 by 10 to the power of 6 meters per second. 
part C. It says define the mass defect. Two, the energy required to two, separate all the nucleons from the nucleus is the binding energy. The average binding energy per nucleon is a measurement of the stability of the atom. And the graph shows you binding energy per nucleon uh, over with the mass number. And it says use the graph to compare the stability of the nucleus of the mass number of 200 with the nucleus of a mass number 50. Now, what is this all about? Well, in essence, the question is, is what is causing protons and neutrons to be held together? Now, prior to our standard model being developed, which revolves around the concept of bosons and in particular gluons, we have this idea is that we need a certain amount of energy to keep the protons and neutrons together. If we determine the mass of the individual protons and neutrons, and of course, it's multiplied by the number that you have, and measure that against an atom that is the resultant of that, the atom's mass is less than the constituent parts. It's essence like having 10 Lego pieces of let's say equal to 10 grams. And when you stick it together, you get the equivalent of a nine gram particular unit of Lego. You lose mass and that mass is the, called the mass defect. And of course that mass defect, therefore by E equals MC squared becomes our binding energy, which is the energy that is a result of that difference in mass. But in order to give a sense of the stability of the atom, obviously larger atoms will have larger mass defects and therefore larger binding energies. And so you spread that over the total number of nucleons that you have, in other words, the mass number. And so what you end up is getting is this binding energy per nucleon, which is a measure of the stability of our atom. So with that in mind, what we have is the first part defined mass defect. Well, I just talked about that and that's what you basically need to do. It's the difference between the mass of the constituent parts with the total atom in play. Now the second part is, so here's 200 and there we got a value up here. The 50 of course is gonna be value up here. And it says use the graph to compare the stability. Now in our case here, you'll notice that you have a greater binding energy per every nucleon and therefore its stability which is what the question's asking you about compare the stability the stability of the lower mass number is reasonably higher than that of the larger mass number and that's in essence what you do with the question a question d in 2009 we have a three mark question in 1920 rutherford suggested the existence of an undiscovered nuclear particle explain how Chadwick confirmed Rutherford's predictions using the conservation laws. And in order to do this, I'm gonna jump straight into a presentation I did on Chadwick, and I'm just going to basically paste in the experimental setup that he had. What is going on here? Well, basically we have an alpha source, which is traditionally polonium. Now, in this case, what Chadwick did was he fired this at certain materials, and he did this with a variety of materials. So let's say we have got a particular material there, which is gray, let's say it's some sort of like a metal of some sort that produced some sort of radiation coming off. And that radiation then hit our paraffin, which is represented here by yellow. And as a result, it got these knock-on protons. In other words, these protons therefore traveled and then hit this detector. Now the key thing here is, is that he wanted to know what these particles were, because clearly they had momentum because they're able to knock off protons out of my paraffin but he was able to determine the velocity of these particles by using the law of conservation of energy, which is of course LCE, and also the law of conservation of momentum. Assuming that those conservation laws are true, he was able to determine the velocity of these particles. Now, he chose a number of materials, not just a single metal, but basically was able to work out different results. And again, he consistently was able to work out their velocity, but that also meant he was able to work out their ultimately their mass as well. And as a result, determined that whatever these particles were, that they had zero charge, but their mass was just slightly higher than the mass of the proton. Now that was consistent with Rutherford's thinking that there was something else within the nucleus rather than protons. Clearly atoms were heavy because they had large nuclei, but it couldn't account for the fact that they weren't necessarily more positive. So there clearly was a neutral particle somewhere in there. And so Chadwick, by using conservation laws, was able to verify the existence of the neutron.
part E. Now this is a six mark question, and so those who are doing the HSC now from 2019 onwards should expect to see a long response questions. Now our long response questions can be anywhere between seven marks and nine marks responses, and they often basically look at not just one concept, but try to bring in multiple concepts together, or to basically explain what you know. Now in the case of our lectures from prior to 2019, they're particularly related to our options. And in this case, we have a six mark response that deals with theories and experiments that not only help increase our understanding, but generate new questions. So it's a very broad question, and it's trying to get you to answer that within this case, the context of the standard model. Now, what is the standard model? A quick reminder, the standard model is the explanation why we not only have protons and neutrons and electrons, but the whole range of exotic particles that were detected over the 40s and the 50s. And Margell Mann in the early 60s developed a model which we now based as a standard model that basically particles are made up of basically quarks, so multiple quarks. So we have these things called hadrons, which are made up of three quarks. And obviously a protons has two ups and a down, and neutrons are two downs and an up. And we also have electrons, which are our leptons. And then also we have things such as bosons, which are our force particles. Now in this case, this question isn't going to break down the standard model. It's to say how theories and experiments help our understanding but generate new questions. So in other words, how did the standard model develop over time? That's what this is really about. Now I'm not going to go through in great detail of answering this question. Now I can give you a sample answer and it can be found on Nessa's website, but I'll paste it here and you can pause the video if you want to have a closer look. But what I really want to do is actually show you how we mark a longer response type question. And I'm going to pull up the marking guidelines for this particular question. So here is the marking guideline for this particular question. And you'll see we're not looking for six identified features. We're looking at a depth of understanding. And so as you answer the questions, how deep you go, how thorough your understanding is in the particular question will determine the mark that you get. Now, when we pull out the marking criteria, what separates someone who gets a six to someone who gets a one or the two? So, well, obviously six, they demonstrate a thorough knowledge as opposed to a sad knowledge or as a basic knowledge, right? In the person who gets a five or a six, they can describe a theory or experiment that generates a new question. Whereas obviously we're not going to see that, but basically all they do down here, down one, is basically have how theories and experiments have led to an increased understanding of matter. Now there's an and or or here. So clearly someone may not have a basic knowledge of standard model, but have a basic idea of how science works. Clearly a person who's five or six has both of them. They have a strong understanding of the standard model, how that is actually developed, particularly through experiments such as the particle accelerators, such as at CERN or at Fermilab or at SLAC. And obviously for a six as well, in order particularly to get a six out of the range, they have to demonstrate coherence and logical progression. In other words, it's a well thought out response. And so here's my big tip for this particular question. So if you're looking at a question that's six marks, that means about nine or 10 minutes of time for the exam, but you may not need all that 10 minutes to be writing. You may only need five where you spend a considerable few minutes to actually plan out your response. That's the hallmark of someone who's gonna get four marks and also the hallmark of a band six. So that's my advice to you related to this question. Well, that comes to the end of the mod eight, module eight type questions for 2009. Hopefully that has been helpful for you. And I will be producing other videos, not only on module eight, but all the other modules as they relate to specific years of the HSC exam. So that will help you improve your understanding for the HSC type questions as you do the course, or if you're approaching an HSC exam, help give you an opportunity to practice your understanding. Please remember to like, share and subscribe. And again, buy me a coffee if this has been particularly helpful for you. My name is Paul from Physics High. Take care and bye for now.